Good morning and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for this webinar on how to become a MongoDB DBA, and it's all about scaling and sharding today. Uh, my colleague Art von Skeppingen is going to present, and uh, once we share um, the screen, we'll be able to um, uh, to get started. My name is Jean Jerome, and I'll be looking after you for the next uh, hour or so. Um, and if you have any questions on the GoToWebinar system, feel free to um, uh, ask them in the question section of the control panel, or you can chat to me directly using the chat box. And if you have any questions after the webinar, feel free to ask them as well and send me an email at jj at com, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, continue the conversation there. Um, and just before we start with uh, today's topic, I just want to give you a quick introduction of uh, who we are at Several Nines and what we do. Uh, we are a company that um, specializes in um, um, automation and management of open source databases and we focus here on those four key areas that you can see on your screen between deployment, monitoring, management and scaling and we've packaged all of this into a product called Cluster Control of which there are uh, two versions. There is a community edition and a commercial edition as well. And with the community version, you can use the deployment and monitoring features for free for as long as you want. Uh, it also gives you access um, initially for 30 days to all of the commercial features um, that are in the management and uh, scaling uh, area of, uh, of the system. And uh, you can see here some of the, the details around automation management that Cluster Control provides, uh, whether it's deploying you know, on-premises or in the cloud, um, you know, monitoring features and also a whole range of management features, um, some of which I, I touched on uh, just before. It's all around scaling and uh, automating the management of your open source databases. And we support MySQL, all of the different flavors of it, uh, MongoDB and uh, Postgres SQL um, as well. Uh, we have over 8,000 users um, so far that use cluster control um, in, its different, uh, in its different versions. Uh, some of the customers you can also see here who used um, the commercial version of cluster control. Uh, and this is just to give you a quick overview uh, of who we are and what we do. Um, but the topic today is all around MongoDB and how to scale and shard. Uh, my colleague Art is going to present. And to kick things off, I wanted to ask uh, all of you in the audience um, a quick question. And this is to see what version of or versions of MongoDB uh, you're using yourselves currently in your in your roles, uh, whether it's 2.6 or higher, uh, up to 3.2, and uh, maybe you're also using the Bacona version of MongoDB um, or some other version. Um, it'd be great to get your feedback here um, and see um, so that we have a good uh, overview of uh, who we have in the audience today in terms of MongoDB uh, usage. I'll let this run for a few seconds for all of you to participate. Uh, and other could mean also you know, that maybe you're not using MongoDB at all so far. Uh, that I mean, that's also um, that's also an option. And uh, you know, maybe you've joined our MongoDB webinars to find out more. Um, so that it's uh, it'd be interesting to get your your feedback. Uh, I'll just let this run for a few more seconds. Um, also to let you know. Uh, that we're recording this session and we make the recording available over the next few days to you. And uh, you can ask us questions at any moment on the content that you're hearing and seeing about. Uh, we'll take some time at the end of the webinar to answer those questions, uh, of course, and um, uh, have a bit of a conversation there. Um, but for now, I'm just going to close this poll and share the results. Uh, so that's that's an interesting outcome. We had um, we had this webinar uh, already earlier today for um, uh, for people who are based uh, in Europe um, and for you know, European morning time. Um, so and the results were slightly different there. It was a bit more of a mix. Um, so here, so but it seems that today or right now we have um, either three or two users MongoDB or um, you're using something else. So it's either some other version or maybe you're not using uh, MongoDB at all, which uh, which is interesting. And maybe you want to let us know a little bit more about this other part in, um, you know, by texting us in the question section of your control panel. That'd be interesting to hear about. Any reactions from you, Art, before you start with the presentation? No, I think you, you covered that with uh, the other part. I would be interested in what are you using other than uh, MongoDB. I, I would have expected, uh, similar in the morning session, uh, still a couple of users to be on 2.6. Um, a lot of 3.0 users probably have upgraded by now to 3.2. Uh, 
because that's an easy step. 2.6 to 3.0 is a big step. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, content with uh, the outcome. Great, great. So thanks a lot, everyone, for participating in this poll. I'm just going to hide these results and then hand over to you, Art, for the presentation. OK, thanks. All right, so uh, today the topic is uh, scaling and sharding for uh, MongoDB, and it's uh, all in our uh, blog session or blog series of uh, Become a MongoDB DBA. And it kind of fits in there. Uh, we already covered earlier that the webinar is recorded and we will provide a replay soon. Um, and also just ask questions if you have them in the questions uh, section of your GoToWebinar panel. Uh, and you can email us with questions as well after the session. So the agenda for today is uh, mostly around uh, scaling MongoDB. And uh, first, I'm going to question why do we need scaling? When is the right time to start scaling? Uh, then explain a bit more on how to scaling, uh, how to scale out reads with MongoDB. Uh, explain how sharding in MongoDB works. Uh, more about the maintaining the shards of MongoDB, what are the things you have to look for. Uh, and at the end, I'm going to talk a slide, uh, I think two or three slides about cluster control and MongoDB scaling in particular. Uh, we'll end with the Nines control, which is a cloud-based solution uh, launched by us earlier today. Uh, and MongoDB, uh, how it uh, incorporates together. And then we'll do a, a short live demo on cluster control with MongoDB. So the first question we have to ask is when should we scale or why should we scale? Well, the, the, the second question, why do we need to scale is uh, pretty easily to, um, to, to ask what is your current workload on your system. If your workload is too large for the current system to keep up with it, um, it may be time to scale your system. Also, if you have a pretty decent uh, running cluster, but you have peak loads that are saturating the system, everything starts to get to a grinding halt, maybe it's time to scale your system. And also, if this space is uh, nearing its capacity, let's say you, you have used 70% of your capacity already, maybe it's time to start scaling those disks. And how do we scale then? Well, we can do that vertically and horizontally, and uh, especially MongoDB focuses on the horizontal scaling. So vertical scaling is basically adding more power to your system. So adding a faster CPU, more memory, even larger disks maybe, um, or faster disks if that's necessary. And you can scale this way pretty easily. You just change a couple of components in your server and you're done. You don't have to change anything in terms of databases. Maybe there's a bit of downtime, uh, but it's not that that scale. However, if your growth of the database is larger than Moore's law, so you have more connections coming in, then uh, you can cope with uh, the high-end CPUs or uh, your storage is not uh, big enough. You only have 12 disks you can put into your system. And uh, well, you've used the maximum capacity Maybe it's time to take a different approach. And this is especially applicable to vertical scaling. You run into other barriers. Also, another reason to do uh, horizontal scaling is because the cost may be very high. Even though you only use maybe one or two expensive, really expensive boxes. Um, especially for, for people who are from the Oracle world, they, they probably are used to paying, uh, let's say, 100,000 for a single server because, well, that's the only way you can scale. And that's indeed vertical scaling. You, you pay a lot of money, but for 100,000, uh, you can probably buy a lot of smaller commodity boxes that are doing roughly the same. So that's where we enter horizontal scaling. You just scale by adding more machines. You have multiple machines doing the same workload. And by dividing your workload over these nodes, you can probably do the same or maybe even more than just one big chunky machine. Uh, many hands make light work. That's exactly what uh, horizontal scaling does. However, it adds another layer of complexity uh, horizontal scaling means that you have to uh, 
well, you have to coordinate each and every node in your cluster. You have to know which node in the cluster is uh, available. You will get, for instance, a lot of network traffic uh, for checking which one is part of the cluster and which node is not. And therefore, you need an orchestration system. These orchestration systems for uh, horizontal scaling are obviously uh, things like uh, Hadoop, or uh, you have uh, MySQL Fabric, and MongoDB has built in. If you do horizontal scaling on databases, um, you can do basically two types of scaling. So you have read scaling and write scaling. If you're offloading your read operations to a slave or a secondary node, that's read scaling. You can also uh, offload these read operations to a caching layer. Um, that may not be always the best option especially if you uh, apply the cache on the database level. We've seen that with MySQL often enough. Um, and then there is write scaling where you are offloading your write operations to another master or another primary node. And that basically means that your data may not be on the same node again as you had it previously. So this is often referred to as sharding. You are basically now splitting uh, your database in half into two machines. Now, for the sharding types, uh, we have uh, functional sharding and we have partition sharding. Functional sharding is basically splitting your uh, database, or if you have two databases on one single box, you put one database on uh, uh, cluster one and another one on cluster two, or if you're running a single node or replica set, um, that doesn't really matter, but you're basically splitting it uh, on the level of either a database or maybe a table or in MongoDB terms, a collection. This tends to give uneven reads and writes. And the reason I'm saying that is because you may have a collection or a database that is receiving a continuous stream of uh, click data, for instance, and that's a continuous set of writes while another uh, collection on the same box that you just sharded into a new cluster is actually only doing writes every once so often whenever a user comes to your portal or uh, does an update on their profile. So it depends on the user uh, that uh, is going to write data. So that means that one cluster is continuously busy and the other one has peak loads. Also, another issue is you cannot join the data anymore because they are physically separated. So uh, your data set of maybe the same user is now on two separate database machines. And you can't join that data unless you do that on the client side. Once you have stepped into the functional sharding, the only way to keep it or keep scaling it, suppose you're running out of this space again, um, you can only vertical scale this. You cannot just split a table into half unless you get into the partition sharding. The partition sharding is basically uh, taking all of your data and uh, making small pieces of data and spread that over multiple nodes. And that gives you an even read and write, um, or is supposed to give you even read and write um, separation. And don't get me wrong, but in some cases, you still end up with one node only getting all the writes and all the read requests. Uh, but that is depending on your sharding scheme. We'll get to that uh, later in this uh, webinar. Uh, and this is obviously called horizontal scaling because you can easily add another shard. And adding another shard will uh, just give you more uh, capacity in terms of writes. Now, if we're going to do one step back, and we're going to look at read scaling first for MongoDB. Um, this is what a typical MongoDB replica set looks like. Uh, you have your users who make requests to a web server or application server. They read and write from the MongoDB primary, and the MongoDB primary is replicating to the MongoDB secondaries. A lot of IT managers immediately uh, ask, the question, can't we use these MongoDB secondaries because they're doing nothing? We're paying for a, a three-node cluster in this case, and only the primary is being used, and those secondaries are sitting there and doing nothing. Um, well, you can use them, uh, 
but there are a lot of caveats here. And that's what we're going to show you in this webinar uh, or in this section, because um, it's not that easy. It's not, not just enabling reads on the secondaries and all of a sudden uh, we have uh, more, uh, how to say that, uh, a more efficient use of our hardware as the IT manager would like it to be. So there are a couple of considerations we need to make up front. Uh, as I just discussed, the read and write requests all go to the primary. And the reason why MongoDB does that by default is that MongoDB replication is asynchronous. The same applies to MySQL. Uh, uh, MongoDB replication uh, does not uh, mean that you will have consistent data over each and every node in the cluster at the same time. So inconsistent data may be returned from a secondary node if you're reading from it. Uh, second reason is overloading. These secondaries may be dangerous for failover. I'll describe why that can happen. And the third reason is sharded environments. If you have a sharded environment, um, if you're reading from a secondary node, you might actually be reading data that has been migrated from one shard to another already, but hasn't been updated yet or actually haven't, hasn't been deleted yet from that secondary in that chart. Uh, so that's also a very good reason not to read from uh, secondaries in a sharded environment. Now, if we look at the asynchronous replication, I already said that it's like MySQL replication asynchronously, uh, and the eventual consistency means that eventually this cluster or this replica set will contain all the data, However, um, these nodes may not be at the same state at the same time. Um, that also means that if you start reading from your uh, secondaries, the, the data you will get returned is not the same as the one you would uh, expect from the primary. And if your application can't handle that, that is actually a very big issue. Um, then there's an option you can do in a MongoDB driver, and every MongoDB driver out there supports this. That's called write concern. A write concern can enforce data to be securely written and to get a confirmation that it's actually on more than one node. So write concern con contains two components. It's got the highly available uh, and the durability aspect of it. So high availability means that it will wait for confirmation from a secondary node, uh, either a one, two, three, four, depending on uh, the number of nodes in your cluster or the majority of the nodes in your cluster. Uh, that can be done automatically. Or even if you tag all your uh, nodes in your cluster, you can get a confirmation by X number of nodes. Durability basically means that um, uh, the, the write operation will wait for it to be written to disk. And if we zoom in on that, we have an application server that's writing data to MongoDB and its driver says like, okay, I want uh, this to be written uh, without any durability. And then it, MongoDB applies it to memory, similar to MySQL. And uh, the issue here is that if this MongoDB um, machine just dies spontaneously, uh, a power cut for instance, that means that uh, it has been applied in memory, but it hasn't been applied to disk. So if you want to ensure that data gets written to disk, you uh, just push in uh, the J equals true parameter in the, the write concern, and then it will wait for confirmation that it has been written to the journal by the primary. And this may take like a, a few milliseconds extra. It's an optimization. Now, if we look at the uh, other write concern, like the confirmation from the other nodes, um, here we have a write concern of two, meaning that two nodes need to have this write uh, before it can be uh, confirmed by MongoDB. So we first apply it to the primary, then it gets replicated to the secondary. And once the secondary has applied this, it will confirm that back to the primary and the primary can respond to the client uh, that the data has been written. And as you can see, the, the second secondary uh, hasn't received the data yet. So even though you get a response back that the data has been written, uh, another node may not have the data yet. 
Then uh, the other concern that we have for scaling out reads is overloading secondaries. Secondaries are used for high availability in MongoDB, and that basically means that they contain a copy of the data. So in case your primary dies, the secondary can take over. Uh, but also they take part in a voting process for a new primary. So if the primary dies, the secondaries will vote for a new primary. And to, to do that, to get that primary up and running, you need a majority of the nodes in your uh, MongoDB replica set. So that also means that if you are using uh, more capacity of the secondaries than actually the number of secondaries minus one can handle, you cannot spare one secondary to be down. So if one of the secondaries then fails, that means that the load is distributed equally over the remaining secondary nodes and they uh, create a cascading effect where all of them will uh, kind of tip over because they get a too high load to actually uh, still serve out all the, the query requests. And also, um, what happens then is if you don't have any secondaries remaining or you don't have a majority anymore, the primary gets demoted to become a secondary. And once that happens, you cannot write anymore to your MongoDB replica set. And that's even worse. So this is a, a very big concern. Always have enough secondaries to spare. If we put that together in a small flow diagram, you can see that there are only a few occasions where you can actually make use of scaling out reads using secondaries. So can your primary cope with read workload? Yes, well, then don't use secondaries. There's no use in uh, starting to scale out reads if uh, the primary is still able to cope with the read workload, even though your IT manager asks you to. Um, can the primary cope with read load? No, well, can your application cope with stale data? If it can't, don't use secondaries or rework your application. If it can cope with stale data, well, are, do you have enough secondaries? No, don't use secondaries. And if you have enough secondaries, are you part of a sharded cluster? If yes, don't use secondaries because you might actually be serving out wrong data from the wrong um, uh, from the wrong uh, shard. And if no, well, you can scale out using secondaries. And obviously uh, that's only a limited number of, uh, a limited number of uh, uh, cases where you can actually apply this. Now, if you're starting to offload reads to secondaries, there are a lot of other considerations to make. Uh, here we start reading from a secondary, um, but, uh, that doesn't mean that if the secondary will uh, be gone, that uh, we actually have been reading consistent data. To influence this, we can set a read preference on the connection. So we want to read data from the primary, that's the default. So we always read data from the primary, uh, but um, we can extend that with primary preferred. So we always read from the primary unless the primary is down and then we are allowed to read from a secondary. Secondary, always read from a secondary, no primary allowed. Uh, secondary preferred, always read from secondary and only read from a primary if no secondary is available. And then the last option is nearest where you're taking the nearest node to, uh, to you in terms of network latency. So if we look at this in a diagram, we can see that this is the default. If uh, our primary uh, would die all of a sudden, well, we can't read any data anymore. So if we apply primary preferred, we are allowed to read from a secondary if the primary is unavailable. This is actually a very good option to do. Um, if you have read preference secondary, uh, might sound excellent because you can read from two nodes in this case instead of one primary. But if both of these secondary nodes are gone, you can no longer perform read operations. And if you do, for instance, a read operation before writing data, <clears throat> this cannot happen anymore. So therefore you have a secondary preferred. And you might think that this is a bit odd because if, uh, let's say, the secondaries would 
go away, the primary no longer is a primary. I, I've explained that earlier. So the primary gets demoted to a secondary. So we cannot do any write operations anymore. However, uh, this uh, mode is most of the time uh, working together with the arbiter node to ensure that at least you have a voting uh, node in your replica set that is going to keep the primary alive. Uh, and especially that has to be the majority of the nodes. So keep in mind that if you use secondary preferred, always use an arbiter in your uh, replica set. Uh, read preference nearest is the last one. Uh, suppose we have these nodes, we have a secondary with a low ping time of 50 milliseconds. This is the, the one most likely to receive the read request. And I'm saying most likely because if the secondary is already receiving a lot of queries, MongoDB will pick the other secondary even though it has a higher latency. But this is to, to prevent uh, overloading uh, one secondary. If the secondary is gone, any of the other nodes can be picked. So it can also be the primary in this case. Then we allow filtering with tags. So if you have made the selection and you set the read preference to nearest, you can also filter down the nodes that apply to nearest by some sort of filter that you can use for tagging. So that's the tagging that you apply to these nodes, for instance, uh, data center one and data center two or the rack position, uh, that can be used to narrow down your search. And in the case of this example, we have a data center one and data center two, and we explicitly want uh, a note from the second data center because we are on the other side of uh, the ocean and we do not want to use a very expensive lease line to get our data from data center one in this example. You can also use it to filter down other roles. So we have a role primary, role read, uh, we can, uh, tell it to get everything from role read and then have, for instance, the analytics uh, role being used by the data warehouse that is pulling in like a nightly load uh, that would stress out the, this, this particular secondary. And it will only go to this secondary that is suitable for that. So this is also a nice way to filter it. Uh, there are some limitations to scaling the reads in, uh, in a replica set. The replica set can only contain 50 nodes maximum and a seven node voting in total. So that means that you have a couple of limitations. Also in these 50 nodes, the arbiter nodes are counted in. So if you have 30 uh, arbiter nodes, you only have 20 data nodes remaining. So it might not be a wise idea to do that. Uh, and also keep in mind that if those seven voting nodes will uh, disappear for a reason, there are no voting nodes left to vote for a new primary. So that's also an, an, uh, something to keep an eye out for. Um, MongoDB doesn't need uh, a, an intermediate master like MySQL. So 50 nodes attached to one primary is perfectly fine because MongoDB can replicate from, from other secondaries. And it will do that automatically if the primary is, for instance, uh, further away from the secondary than uh, the primary. So before heading into sharding with MongoDB, we have another question uh, uh, for you. JJ? Yeah, thanks, Art. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the question we want to ask you was all around, well, it's all around scaling and sharding, really, and it's to um, figure out with you whether you're considering uh, read scaling and sharding on MongoDB yourselves at the moment. Uh, if you are or if you aren't, maybe you're not sure yet. Um, and uh, maybe you're also already reading from secondaries or you've already enabled sharding on MongoDB. It'd be really interesting to find out about that and uh, just get your feedback um, uh, to see um, what um, what your thinking is there um, amongst you in the audience today. So let us run for a few seconds and uh, we'll take the time also just to remind you that you can ask um, questions on today's content at any moment uh, by using the questions section of your control panel and we'll take a few minutes towards the end of the webinar to go through these questions and uh, answer them there. But for now, I'll uh, let this poll run so you can all participate. And uh, thank you for doing so. And as always, um, we'll share the results, of course, um, 
once everyone has had a chance to, to participate. Uh, so thank you for now. I'm going to close this and share the results. Uh, great, so it's, actually, um, so it's actually a nice mix, I suppose. So between some of you who are already considering weed scaling and sharding and those who are not quite sure yet, so um, hopefully the webinar will <clears throat> give you some uh, some insight and you know, some incentives on um, for con for considering uh, for considering this, and um, uh, Art, any reactions from your side on on these uh, answers? Um, it's a bit different than the audience we had this morning, where um, the well, the majority was still not sure yet, um, and I don't think anyone had enabled uh, or, or considered it immediately so it's good to see that a lot of people are actually considering it uh, even uh, just to, to watch this webinar on what what will you encounter it's a bit odd that it's 38% uh, and 63% that adds up to 101% uh, that, that, <laughs> so that must be some rounding uh, issue yeah we'll, we'll have to investigate that yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> Yeah, that is interesting. But thanks very much, everyone, for your participation. And so when we say this morning, we actually mean European time. So I know that uh, So I think most of you are um, um, listening right now and following us right now uh, in the morning time in the US. Um, but Art and I are based in Europe. So when we say morning, we meant earlier today. Um, yeah, but yeah, so this, yeah, so 101, we have to investigate this. But thanks very much for your participation in this poll. And uh, with this said, I'll hand back over to you, Art. OK, thanks. Okay, so now uh, sharding with MongoDB. Uh, we're going to uh, do write scaling instead of read scaling. So MongoDB has a couple of sharding components readily available, like the shard router, the config server, and the shards. And those are the components they chose to use to do the, the uh, sharding of MongoDB. Shard router is a very small router proxy uh, basically connecting to the config server to get the metadata on the shards. Uh, config server is a special replica set, a really small replica set containing the shard administration and the shards obviously are containing the data. And uh, these shards uh, exist out of replica sets. So MongoDB chose to reuse their component called replica sets to make shards. And these replica sets do not share any information with each other. So they don't know that they actually are part of a uh, sharded environment um, because that's all hidden behind the shard router. And these shards do not know anything about other shards either. Just to keep everything as simple as possible. If we look at the typical MongoDB sharding environment, we, we have the sharding tier where uh, the Mongo S uh, is the shard router that's over here. Uh, and Mongo S is getting its information from the config server, which is a special replica set. And it reads and writes to the appropriate shards in the sharding tier. And you can see that these secondaries are all behind the primary and are not being queried. Upon. And that's also a decision that uh, MongoDB made with uh, the, the whole sharding setup that the shard router should never read from a secondary. Now, for the shard router, uh, as I said, it's transparent, uh, transparently uh, showing a data set. In this example here, we have 100 million rows uh, collection, and that collection is actually spread over four shards in total, where each of these shards contain 25 million rows. As you can see, you can spread out um, your data quite easily uh, and hiding that behind the shard router. The shard router will make that transparently. So if we apply a query that would uh, uh, be sent to shard B, shard C, and shard D, for instance, they return a certain uh, result set with uh, maybe five rows, 10 rows, a thousand rows, and that will be returned to the shard router and the shard router will then combine that result set into a result set that will go back to the client, so the, the MongoDB driver. 
Uh, nice part about that is that it's all 100% transparent for the client. They will not notice anything about um, the shard router sitting in between them and the actual replica sets that it's querying upon. For sharding, uh, we need some metadata. Uh, I explained that earlier. This metadata contains out of uh, what MongoDB calls chunks. So we have a big data set and we partition this data set by slicing that into ranges. So we have a range going from uh, 1 to 10, uh, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, etc. And these ranges, those chunks, are basically defined by your shard key. So your shard key uh, is, um, well, it, it's kind of dictating how uh, the sharding will be applied to each and every shard. So which one will get what chunk. These chunks are then distributed as evenly as possible over each shard. And the MongoDB balancer will balance these chunks over shards if they're not distributed evenly. Uh, and also, if a chunk is too large, uh, the, a new chunk is created and will be filled with new data. So the shard router is actually the one that creates those chunks as we go. Uh, and these new chunks are uh, then assigned to the shard with the most available space. So if you have one big shard, let's say you call that uh, uh, archive shard, with uh, a few terabytes of data, while well, all your other shards have maybe a few gigabytes of data or a, a space available, then your archive uh, shard will always get the new shards uh, or the new chunks, sorry. Uh, th this can be an issue, so keep an eye out on, uh, your, uh, on the shard distribution and chunk distribution. Sharding metadata is then stored in a config server, and this is a really tiny replica set. So the, the total metadata of sharding is not, well, it's not going to be more than a gigabyte in size, unless you have really, really large sharded environment. Now, if we look at the, the chunks and shards, as I mentioned earlier, we have ranges where the, the chunks are defined. So we have here a shard router that has chunk A, chunk B, chunk C where the chunk A is defined as the minimum key. So that's like uh, a zero on the identifier up until 1002. And then we have chunk B, 1003 until 2045, and then 2046 until the maximum key. And those that's basically the current chunking of this collection. And then if the shard router receives a query for uh, identifier 457, it will redirect the query to chunk A, if it's on 1635, it will go to chunk B. If it's on 8842, it will go to chunk C. And of course, the shard router doesn't know anything about whether these documents actually exist on those chunks. So even though uh, the document for 8842 doesn't exist on chunk C, that basically means that, uh, or it doesn't mean that it's not going to send that query. It's going to send that query to chunk C and chunk C will respond back that this document doesn't exist. So the shard router is not that intelligent, but it at least is routing it according to the schemes. Now balancing shards, uh, we have uh, three shards here where the shards are not balanced properly. We have shard A and B containing three chunks. Shard C only has one. So the, the shard balancer will migrate uh, one of the chunks from shard B to shard C. And this is an operation that happens in the background. Now I mentioned earlier that the shard key is a very important component in the sharding scheme. Uh, it can only be placed on an index field or an index compound field. So you have an index compound field existing out of three or four fields, and then it can be on that as well. Uh, once you have set a shard key on a collection, it cannot be altered. So it's not, it's, it's irreversible. If you want to, um, well, if you, if you are not happy with the way everything gets sharded, the only way to alter this scheme is by creating a new collection and uh, exporting everything from the sharded collection into this new collection. And of course, you can apply uh, new shard keys on that new collection as well. But it is basically an export. 
Only the identifier field and the short key can be unique, which is another limitation. But if you think about it, that you have another field that will be a unique, the unique constraint is on the collection level, uh, meaning that uh, each individual shard um, can contain a unique value then. So it, the unique value can exist on multiple shards, and this is not what it's intended for. The shard key is also um, kind of influencing the, the way your data gets distributed. And that also means that the effectiveness of your shards may be influenced by the choice of your shard key. Now, if we look at shard key distribution in the example here, we have all chunks over each and every shard evenly. So these shards are probably the same size. Uh, have the same amount of disk space and it's distributed evenly, but in reality they may be uh, a, a bit imbalanced. Now if we have a shard key that is optimal for writing data, we can make a choice between, for instance, sequential writes and random writes. Sequential writes will mean that we have identifiers or timestamps that, ident uh, that we used as a shard key, <clears throat> and that means that uh, we sequentially will uh, go from shard A to shard B to shard C, so that each and every chunk will be filled up sequentially. And that also means that only one shard at a time will be written to if you do a lot of inserts. If you have a lot of updates on your data set, it would kind of randomly uh, distribute over each shard. But if you have these sequential identifiers or timestamps being used with inserts, only one shard at a time will be written to. And to uh, optimize that, uh, MongoDB offers a hash a function on top of your shard key to randomly distribute your writes to each and every node. However, with uh, this has a couple of uh, drawbacks, and we'll get to that with the reads. Random writes, like username or UUID or date of birth, uh, kind of randomize the writes to each and every shard, uh, and it will write over each shard at the same time, um, that should be good unless you really want to have like a sequential read uh, back from the system. So if we're going to look, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm now jumping ahead. So if we look at the shard key without the hash function um, and we have a sequential write here in a timestamp that is uh, only going to be inside the range of chunk C, all the writes go to chunk C. And if we apply the hash function, oh, it's a bit slower than I thought. So if we have the hash function on top of this, uh, it will kind of change the, the number that we're trying to write. So um, it will move it to different chunks at the same time. Now, if we consider the reading the data back, uh, we have range queries that are going to be covered by the shard key or are not covered by the shard key. So think about these sequential identifiers. I want identifier 1 to uh, 30. Um, the shard router will know on which shards it needs to query these, um, uh, send the query to. So if it actually stays on one single shard, only one single shard has to be queried. And that also means that um, the, the, these range queries will be a lot more, uh, will be, will respond a lot quicker uh, because the, the shard router doesn't have to merge each and every request uh, it's getting back from, the, from each and every shard. Now, if you have a range query that's not covered by the shard key, uh, the shard router will simply not know which shards to query. And that also means that we need to query all the shards at the same time. So we send a query to each and every shard, and then the shard router has to wait until each and every shard has replied. Um, obviously, there are some timeouts on top of that, uh, that if it hasn't received a reply back before X amount of seconds, it will just return whatever it has. Uh, however, if you have fields that are not covered by an index and you perform a range query on that, it simply will probably take too long for the, the shard router to respond to that. And then you will basically do not get any records back. And yeah, this is one of the drawbacks of choosing this shard key scheme. 
also think about the hash function on top of uh, a range uh, shard key, it will get into the second um, uh, the second case where these writes are randomly distributed over each and every node. So selecting ranges from your uh, identifiers also means that it's not going to be optimal for reading your data back. So either you have a very good performance on reading or on writing. That's basically the trade-off you have to make. Now, maintaining shards with MongoDB, uh, once you have set up your shards, uh, there are a couple of things that are different compared to normal MongoDB replica sets. So on MongoDB replica sets, you just make a backup of your replica set and you can do that on basically any node in your replica set. For a sharded cluster, you have to backup the config server, which is the metadata. You have to backup each and every shard, one node per shard and preferably the primary because that is the one that contains all the necessary information. And then you uh, have the issue that these backups have to be started at the same time, but may not actually end at the same time. So that means that while making the backup of your config server, which is probably very, very quick, uh, the shards that take maybe an hour, two hours to make a backup of are not consistent with the config server anymore. So Percona made a consistent backup tool for that, and it basically does the backup orchestration of uh, a sharded cluster. And it, it will just stream the uplock on all shards until the backup has been made on each and every shard and the config server in this cluster. So that's a good one to check out. Uh, monitoring is all slightly different. Most of the monitoring will be the same, um, but as your write capacity has increased largely, you will probably need to look at the next bottleneck. The most obvious one is range queries, which may touch every shard. And the effect of that is that the number of connections to your shards will increase. Uh, also watch out for non-sharded collections. If, um, uh, let's say, a new collection is created on um, on Mongo, the Mongo uh, router. Uh, it will be assigned to basically uh, any node in the cluster that has like the largest disk space available because it's creating a new, uh, let's say, chunk, uh, but it's not administered at a, as a chunk. And it, basically, if you start writing a lot to this collection that is not sharded, it will use up all available space. Capacity planning is uh, the next po point you want to look into. You basically monitor the number of chunks per shard, take the total number of shards. You can see whether there's imbalance. At the same time, watch the disk space per node and then see whether you need to balance out things here. Um, you can add a new shard quite easily and then the, the MongoDB balancer will take over and will balance out each and every chunk uh, to the new node that is necessary to make it balanced again. This gives you an increase in I.O., so keep an eye out on that. It is supposed to be pretty okay on I.O. It's going to keep an eye on I.O. itself and not make it excessive. Uh, but for large clusters, this also means that it may take forever to start balancing this. And also watch out for new databases and collections in this same case. Um, about balancing, uh, no, sorry, about the shards, adding a shard is really easy. You just deploy a new empty, empty replica set and you add it to the cluster with one single command. This is the new shard I want to add to my sharded environment. Now, for the balancing part, um, the MongoDB shard balancer runs in the background, and that also means that it gives a bit of background noise. So if you're making backups, you definitely want to disable the shard balancer, especially because it's moving uh, chunks that you want to backup from one shard to another. Um, and also you can schedule these balancers or unschedule them for a certain time. Uh, that can also help a lot. You can also disable the balancer on a specific collection. So uh, the example I gave earlier, it really applies to that. You have a collection uh, that uh, basically is very large. And if you would continuously balance that, that would take forever. And it's just going to push data back and forth between 
shards. Um, so you can disable it for that collection particularly, and then just have the shard ruler figure out where to put each new chunk. For consistency reasons, uh, I named that earlier, don't read from secondaries in a sharded environment. Um, and also do never connect to the shards directly and, and alter any data. It's similar to, to making changes on a MySQL uh, slave and then uh, uh, read from that directly. Uh, the data may be inconsistent. Also, um, uh, the shard router will actually uh, hide chunks that are basically on the secondary, still on the secondaries, while they have been moved on the primary already. Uh, cluster control and MongoDB scaling. Um, I mentioned earlier that I'm going to highlight a bit what uh, cluster control can do with MongoDB. So MongoDB uh, replica set can be deployed. Once uh, cluster control has deployed a MongoDB replica set, you can scale the replica set by adding secondaries to it. And you can add arbitrary nodes for voting. And we can also make reliable backups. We can schedule them and restore them. For the MongoDB sharded cluster, we have a bit more advanced uh, deployment mechanism because we need to deploy shard routers, we need to deploy the config servers, and we need to deploy the number of shards that you want. And that's really easy. It's a, it's a wizard where you can run through it. Uh, you can scale by adding new shards to, uh, to the existing sharded clusters. And in the upcoming version 1.33, we can convert a replica set into a sharded cluster. So if you already have a replica set, with a click of a button, you can convert that to a sharded cluster, uh, including the uh, shard routers and config servers. Also, we support the Percona consistent MongoDB backup tool to make cluster-wide consistent backups. Nines Control and MongoDB, I named earlier that we launched Nines Control today. Nines Control, allow, uh, we allow you to deploy and monitor in the cloud. So Nines Control basically uh, allows you to deploy a MongoDB uh, cluster in uh, AWS, for instance, so in Amazon or in uh, DigitalOcean at the moment. You can easily go through a three-step uh, wizard and choose what you want to install, how many nodes you want, uh, simply uh, select which is your cloud provider, and then select the location of the, uh, where you want to have it and what type of boxes you want to have. And once you have done that, you have created your new uh, cloud environment and then you can start monitoring it. And for monitoring, uh, we offer the most obvious things like ops counters, but also replication, CPU stats, IO and uh, network usage. And this is a really nice alternative to uh, uh, to existing cloud providers that have, for instance, uh, uh, their own MongoDB uh, kind of flavor. Uh, you do not get like a, a single cloud lock-in. This allows you to actually expand over multiple clouds. Um, yeah, it's time for uh, for the live demo. Uh, I'm going to switch my screen to cluster control. So for cluster control, uh, I already mentioned that we can uh, deploy any cluster. So if we would create a database cluster, we can deploy a replica set for MongoDB shards in a very easy four-step wizard. Uh, what we also can do is import existing uh, MongoDB replica sets and shards. So if you already have your MongoDB replica set, you can easily import it into cluster control. Uh, once you have your cluster up and running, in this case, we have a very big sharded cluster. You can see here that uh, uh, it's a Percona flavored one, but we also have support for MongoDB flavored ones. Uh, if we go to the shard overview, you can easily uh, look at what is my shard doing. So this is like uh, shard zero, shard one, shard two, and they're doing a lot of queries. Um, and you can also keep an eye out for the config servers. How many writes do they get? Well, it's not that much at this moment. And the Mongo routers, which are the Mongo S servers. So we offer uh, a lot of uh, overview for the sharded environment. 
In the sharded environment, we also have the backups where you can schedule them. So uh, where we have support for MongoDump and the MongoDB consistent backup, which is the Patona consistent backup. We offer next to monitoring, managing of the host configurations, uh, and also allow you to look at the MongoDB system logs from here. For the MongoDB replica sets, we only show you uh, the replica set that we're looking at. So um, it's a bit less big overview, but basically we offer the same functionality and with backups obviously do not have the consistent backup because it's not necessary. Uh, if we want to scale out, we can simply add a new node to our replica set, uh, which is either a database server or arbiter node. And it's that easy, Ju just, um, just fill this dialog in and you basically add a new node to your cluster. Um, and I think we're almost out of time. So I'm going to add back to the question and answers. Uh, before heading into the questions and answers, we uh, still have a question to ask for you. Right, JJ? We do, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, thank you, Art. Uh, and this is to ask uh, all of you um, how you currently monitor and manage MongoDB. Uh, it'd be interesting to uh, to get your feedback here. You know whether you have your own scripts or you use maybe open source tools for that. Uh, maybe you use the existing MongoDB um, kind of official uh, tools and systems. Uh, maybe you use Cast Control. Um, Pocona also have a new tool called PMM. Uh, so it'd be great to uh, to get your feedback here and see um, see how you go about um, monitoring and managing uh, MongoDB. I just give this um, a few seconds for everyone to uh, participate. And uh, thanks for your participation here, of course. If you do have any questions on today's content, you can still ask them in the question section of your control panel. We're almost on the hour, so we don't have that much time left, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to a, um, a question or two for sure. Uh, so feel free to use the question section of your control panel to, um, to ask uh, some questions. Uh, but for now, thanks for your feedback here and for participating in this uh, last poll. Um, I'll just close this now and share the results. Uh, great. So uh, again, this is quite different from the um, from the earlier session we had um, uh, for in the morning time for Europe. Um, but this is a, an interesting uh, outcome. So I think uh, earlier today we also had a lot of people using in-house scripts or open source tools and al also other um, other ways uh, of monitoring and managing MongoDB. Um, but uh, here right now we also have some MongoDB Atlas or MMS users, which is uh, which is interesting to see. Uh, Art, any any reactions to uh, to these outcomes? Well, like you said, this morning we had uh, a lot of people using in-house scripts. I think I think the majority was using that. Um, and MongoDB Atlas, well, good to see that some people are using it um, and that they are attending our webinar. So, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, also interesting to see that, uh, uh, well, the in-house scripts are really, uh, or open source, obviously, uh, I would be quite interested in what they would be using then. Of course, you, you can leave that in a, in a comment or in a, in a questions uh, section. Great, uh, great. Thanks, Art, and thanks everyone for uh, for providing your feedback here. Uh, I'm just going to um, uh, hide those results, and um, maybe Art, we can switch to the last slide just uh, to share already yeah. um, some of the links to, you know, to the resources that we have because we're on the hours. So, uh, if some of you don't have time to stay on, then um, um, we understand if you need to drop off. But you've got some uh, links here to um, this new uh, cloud uh, tool uh, called Nines Control, which we just released today, which enables you to deploy and monitor uh, very quickly um, both MySQL and MongoDB uh, in uh, a cloud of your choice. It gives you the flexibility to migrate and uh, avoids um, you know, being locked into a particular cloud. So feel free to check that out. And also our Cyber Nines blog, you know, there's a section on it just on MongoDB. Uh, so um, feel free to follow that. And if you want to um, download class control and uh, start using that, um, you've got the link here as well. 
Um, and we are so uh, so we are on the hour. There was one question here, um, uh, Art, on um, someone who's uh, who's actually using MySQL, but they're thinking of moving to MongoDB. Yeah. Uh, what impact might that have on their application? Is that is that going to be a tricky a tricky move, or Ooh. what what would be your recommendations here? Um, well, I can give a very very long answer, <laughs> but I'll try to keep it as short as possible. Um, so I, I think in general, uh, MySQL and MongoDB are, are very different uh, databases uh, in terms of how they operate. Um, so it really depends on how your application is using it. Uh, one of the things that's very different between MongoDB and MySQL is that you cannot join data uh, on the database itself. Uh, so if you want to join data between two collections, you have to do that client side. And that's different between MySQL and, um, of course, uh, MongoDB. That being said, a lot of uh, ORMs, if your application makes use of an ORM, like, for instance, Django is using uh, the South, for instance, for MySQL, and it can also use the same for MongoDB, you can just simply switch your ORM, and then the ORM will take care of the differences between MySQL and MongoDB. And that may work for 80, 90% of the cases. So it really depends on the application, I would say, and on whether you're using ORM or not. Great, uh, great. Thanks, Art, and thanks for um, for the short ver <laughs> for the short version of the answer. I could have gone there with five minutes explanation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure. I'm sure. No, thanks very much, Art. All right. And uh, thank you for the question to uh, Kamal. Um, so we just we, we are over the hour, um, and um, so I think we'll, we'll call it um, we'll call it a day for now. Um, thanks very much, Art, for the presentation, and uh, thanks to uh, every one of you who participated uh, today. Um, we'll make the replay and the slides available to you within the next uh, couple of days. Um, we do have a last webinar scheduled for this year or planned for this year um, on MySQL replication, and that will be for the first week of December, so feel free to join us for that if uh, you have an interest in MySQL replication. Uh, but for now, um, uh, thanks again, Art. Thanks to all of you. Have a great rest um, of the day and uh, a good week, um, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, and uh, take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.